And we're honored to have with us a, uh, the youngest member of the uh, World Economic Forum here in Dali. Eh? Uh, her name is Isabel Weissen. Uh, she's from Bali, and she has a very compelling story of grassroots leadership to share with us today about plastics and plastic waste. Isabel, would you please come to the stage? So to start us off today, I'd like to invite everybody to join me on a little exercise. On the count of three, I want everybody to take a deep breath in. One, two, three. Take a deep breath in and out. And another deep breath in and out. Now, I like to do this for two reasons. The first, because it's a nice way for me to calm the butterflies on stage. But the second is because, yes, Every first breath we take comes from the forest, from the trees and from the green. But it's also a nice reminder that every second breath we take comes from the ocean. My name is Isabel. I'm 16 years old, the co-founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags and an environmental activist since the age of 10. <laughs> I was born and raised on the island of Bali in a house 100 meters from the ocean. So as you can imagine, it's always had a huge influence over myself. And clearly it's had an impact on everyone if it contributes to over half of the oxygen we breathe. But not only that, studies have also shown that people are happier when they are near, surrounded, by, or in the ocean. And so you can ask yourself the question now, if our oceans are so important to us, why do we treat them so badly? I'm sure we've all seen the pictures of beaches overflowing with plastic waste, and sadly, this is the harsh reality for my home island of Bali. No matter where you go, whether you're walking by a river, on the beach, in the mountains, on the side of the road, the plastic is always there. You cannot escape it. And I do recognize that this is not only an issue in Bali. It's a global problem. There's a fact that says that by the year 2050, there's going to be more plastic than fish in our oceans. That's in our lifetime. Now let that sink in. If we look at the numbers, about 80% of the plastic waste you find in the oceans actually come from land. And in Bali, currently only 5% of that waste is being recycled. And so six years ago, my sister Malati, who could not be here today, and I, we asked ourselves the question, OK, what can we do to help solve this problem? And so after doing a little bit of research, we found out that 40 countries around the world at the time had taken their stance against plastic by saying no to the single-use plastic bag. And so in our 10 and 12-year-old minds at the time, we thought, hey, if they can do it, come on, Bali, we can do it too. And so we founded Bye Bye Plastic Bags, which today is an official NGO run by young people on the island of Bali to say no to single-use plastic bags. And through our six years of campaigning, it's been a crazy journey. I always like to think of Bye Bye Plastic Bags as a little bit of my life school, right? It's taught me things and skills that a normal textbook could have never been able to teach me. And some of these lessons I want to share here today. And the first one being, it's all about the team. Or as we like to use fancy words here, human capital, right? And this one we learned pretty early on. Yes, we did start at the beginning with just the two of us, my sister and I. But soon enough, Bye Bye Plastic Bags grew into a huge movement where locally today we have over 20 volunteers helping on a daily or weekly basis and up to 350 volunteers in our global teams. Which brings us to lesson number two. Think outside the box. We constantly have to ask ourselves, OK, how can we overcome our challenges or obstacles in a creative way? How can we do things differently, uniquely, especially with a just do it mentality of young people? And so the story I like to attach to this is Bali's biggest cleanup. Now, at this point in our timeline, I think we were three years into campaigning, and we realized we were losing slowly the momentum of the people. And so during one of our team meetings, we had a discussion on how could we get everyone on the island involved again. And somebody raised their hand, and in a quiet voice, they said, hey, 
I have an idea. Why don't we organize Bali's biggest cleanup ever? And so within six weeks, we were able to organize the first one. But since then, for the past three years in February, we have been able to mobilize over 45,000 people in 325 different locations on the island and have collected over 135 tons of just plastic waste. Another story that we like to add to this lesson is Mountain Mamas. Now, we always get questions like, okay, if we're saying bye-bye to plastic bags, right? What alternatives are there to use? And so as a younger generation, we saw this as an opportunity to create Mountain Mamas, which is a social enterprise that empowers local women in the mountains of Bali to make alternative bags from pre-loved material. It's everything we love. But the thing that makes this enterprise so special is that we pay every woman individually for the bag that she makes, which works really well in the Balinese culture because it allows the women to take ownership over their own working hours as well as their own income. Now, after we purchase the bags from the women, we sell them at a higher retail price, and 50% of the profits actually go back into this community, not the women. Why? Because this ensures to create a better education, healthcare, and a better waste management system, which often lacks in rural and isolated communities in Bali. And so the system becomes a little bit circular, right? The only way to go. But of course, through our campaign, we have experienced many challenges, right? There's been many ups and many downs. One of them being that we are young people. And although we are seen as an inspiration, our age group is sometimes not taken very seriously. Sometimes this goes hand in hand with working with politicians. You know, we say it's a little bit like dancing with them. You take three steps forward and then two steps backwards and the cycle starts all over again. But I think the most common and the, one of the biggest challenges we've had to face is the need to see a change in consumer behavior and producing. It's, it's the need to see a change in mindset and creating the new norm, which has proven to be difficult in history. But I think as consumers, we all have the responsibility to ask ourselves two questions when buying a product. The first one is, where does it come from? And the second is, where does it go? And if you can't answer one of these two questions, the truth is you probably shouldn't buy the product. But these questions, of course, also go to the producers. They have to be aware and responsible about where their resources come from. And in my eyes, I think they have the most responsibility here. But does this mean that we can't produce anymore? No. And does this mean that we have to say no to all plastics? No. But I do believe that we can say no to those single-use items. I mean, it is 2019, right? We're seeing here at this meeting alone that the creativity, innovation, and technology is here to show that solutions are just around the corner. More and more, these bigger corporations are understanding the importance and the value of changing their sourcing and materials. Many years ago, the three R's were hot and to the point, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. But in today's climate, I think we have to add two new R's. The R of refuse, for example, saying no to single-use plastics, and the R of replace, once again, sourcing materials differently at the source of a production. And of course, lastly, personally, I have faced some challenges. Being the age of 16 and having started at the age of 10, it was sometimes hard to keep on going, right? But I think throughout it all, the support of our team has always been there. And so I cannot stress enough that you cannot do it alone. No matter how great of a leader you are or how great of an idea you have, you will always need the support of your team in order to move your idea into a reality. But I think all of these obstacles and all of these challenges has really led up to us learning lesson number three, which is persistence and commitment are key. I think this was probably the most important lesson we could have learned. And I'm sure to all the parents in the room, it's probably the hardest lesson to teach. It's that no matter how hard it gets, you have to keep on going. You have to go the extra mile to make sure what you committed to actually happens and follows through. 
Now, after six years of campaigning with our internal team and various other organizations on Bali, we realized that this lesson really did pay off. Even through a change in leadership from the old governor to the new governor, we were able to stay persistent with our message of making Bali go plastic bag free. And something very exciting to announce, all of this hard work resulted in an announcement in December of 2018 of Bali going plastic bag free, which was finally implemented on June 23rd of an island-wide ban on plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam. Yes. We did it! <laughs> we did it, and we could have not been more excited. And to have had the help and the support of the Indonesian and Balinese government, as you can see here, both the old and the current gov governor of Bali. But as young change makers, we believe that change happens in the classroom. We have spoken to over 50,000 students worldwide. And of course, speaking on stages like the UN or today here at the World Economic Forum and being recognized by Forbes and CNN have definitely been a few of our highlights as well. But I think through our years of campaigning, we have learned that we are not alone, right? Youth are rising everywhere in every corner of the world. We are standing up for issues that are not a thing of the future, but are currently happening today issues that are occurring as we speak. No matter what our passions are, whether it is climate change, the environment, you know, the oceans, inequalities, human rights, dancing, art, science, the list goes on. Whatever your passions are, we are seeing young people standing up for what they think is right and for what they believe in. Young people are demanding change. Because we realize that we don't have the luxury of time anymore to wait for someone else to make that difference. And we see this especially after, when we were two years into our campaign, when other young people heard about our story. They got inspired and they reached out to us saying, hey, can we start up a Bye Bye Plastic Bags back where we come from? And so today, you can find us in over 45 different locations all across the world, all led by different young people, whether they are in middle school, high school, or university students. And now you might be asking yourself the question of what's next, right? Well, after this ban was in place, we know that just because the regulations are there and the policies are there, it does not mean that the work is done. It means that we have to work harder to ensure that these policies are really implemented and enforced into the community. But looking a little bit further down the line, our team is very excited to announce this as we have been working on it under wraps for a couple of years. But in the next two months, we are hoping to launch our next project, Introducing Youthtopia, where we aim to create spaces, platforms, and a headquarter for young people to come together and connect. We hope, because in Utopia we believe that empowered young people accelerate change that can address and solve the current and relevant issues of today's world. It is very much inspired by the SDGs, and so it will not only encompass you know, solutions to problems of the environment and plastics, but hopefully every world issue, as well as peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we hope to connect those who want to become change makers because we know that every young person can become a change maker, but not every young person knows how. And so we hope to give them the tools to grow their skills and to ignite their passions and to bring those incredible young people alongside those who are already on the front lines of change together to really create the solutions to collaborate and to work together because that is the only way that we can create real change. And I want to leave you on this note. Ladies and gentlemen, do not forget that us kids may only be 25% of the world's population, but we are 100% of the future. Thank you. So um, thank you, uh, Isabel, for an incredibly inspiring uh, uh, talk. And um, uh, you know, I can 
tell that you've been doing this for uh, at least six years already, uh, but perhaps uh, a third of, more than a third of your lifetime. Uh, so you're getting very good at it. Thank you. Uh, um, and you know, I think many of us in the audience, you know, we have we have children, and I think the first time I watched you, I I had to think of my own kids, and I thought, you know, they, I know they have that sort of passion; they want to do something. So your idea to start this Youthtopia, uh, I think, is a very very interesting uh, suggestion. And uh, but my first question is, what should where where do we sign up? Uh, what should I where should I tell my kids to go to 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 uh, you know start to engage, and how can they benefit from this? Um, so Utopia hopefully will be launched in the next two months. Um, so we don't have a digital or online platform just yet. Um, December, so, sorry, September is the first course that we are opening up to, to have our first Utopia course online, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. Um, and I think, you know, that will definitely be launched through our Bye Bye Plastic Bags platforms in the current moment. So if you, you know, are interested or want your kid to be um, a part of it, I think that's definitely at this current moment where I could direct you towards. Great. Thank you uh, so much, Isabel. Let's, ha let's hear it up one more time for Isabel. Thank you. So um, <coughs> I would now like to invite uh, two more guests to the stage. Uh, one is Mary Ng the uh, Minister for Small Business and Export uh, Promotion of Canada. And uh, please uh, come on, uh, stand up. And the other one is Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, I'm um, sorry. Penrice. Penrice of Dow Chemical, uh, who is the, uh, the chair of uh, the Asia operations of Dow Chemical. Yes. Please. I think we got the right seats. Yes, I think so. <laughs> So we've got here an, an activist, a young activist, and we have here a, a business leader, mm -hmm. and we have here a government representative. So I think we're, we're fairly balanced on the stage here. Um, and I think I'd like to start with, with business. We've just heard from, uh, from Isabel, from a young activist. Um, John, uh, what, does, what does business do about the plastic problem? A uh, cu couple of points. I mean, first, um, Isabel's speech makes me fundamentally optimistic that we have a large problem, um, but with the passion that we can show, not just with the youth, but in government and in also the business community, um, we can solve it. Um, but, and there's a big but here, um, we have to collaborate. We need the activism from the youth, we need the business community and the financial resources there, and we need the cooperation of government. And only by coming together are we going to have a chance to solve this? We have 93% of all plastic waste going through 10 rivers in Asia and Africa. Um, so although it's an ocean problem, it's actually a river problem. Um, and that requires um, action in infrastructure, um, so waste collection infrastructure. It requires education. Um, it requires innovation. And we can talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing in business to, to bring innovation. And then it requires the, the, um, the activism of cleanup. Um, so, you know, we, we need to mobilize um, our own employees in Dow, um, the alliance that we're part of and we're forming, and I'll talk more about that. Um, but just generally in the community is getting everybody to appreciate that this is an issue and, and start to participate by cleaning up. Uh, you, you just mentioned this uh, alliance. I thought that sounded exciting. Uh, is that an alliance of businesses that, that want to do something together? Can you explain more about that? Yes, I think in, in business we, um, we wanted to make this actionable. Um, and we realized that um, as single companies we couldn't do this on our own. Um, and we needed to find a mechanism to mobilize um, venture capital and entrepreneurs locally to be able to drive change. And so 30 of the largest global companies um, in this space came together. Um, several of them in, in the room. Um, and we formed the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Um, and this is a, an alliance that has created a, a fund, uh, $1.5 billion, um, so real money. And that fund will be made available to entrepreneurs. So anybody who has a project, and maybe Utopia can, can start to um, <laughs> come with projects here, to say, we have an idea, we'd like to get it funded, um, because we, we, you know, we don't have the on-the-ground resources to be able to solve this. So we want to mobilize the, the local communities to be able to do not just pick up, 
but actually um, entrepreneurial things that puts a value in plastic. Plastic is an incredibly valuable material. You know, we dig it up from the ground, we create value for it, it has value. So if I, I use an analogy of the um, aluminum cans um, and the way that those cans have been eliminated as a waste issue, there was money put on the, the can. So the can now gets picked up, it gets collected, it gets recycling. Um, that whole infrastructure of recycling um, needs to be developed for plastics. It doesn't exist today, or it, it does, but it's in a very, very primitive form. Um, if we put a value on something, economics will take care of it, and eventually, you know, we will solve this problem. Now, it's complex, um, but the Alliance is very committed to doing that. We are launching this year. Um, that fund will be active um, um, in, by September. Um, and we'll, we'll actually be able to start dispensing funds to, to entrepreneurs who can, who can start to, to make a difference um, rather than we just talk about it. The other major piece we're doing is talking to governments. Um, so also the WEF has the, um, the Global Plastics Action Partnership. Um, we are engaging on governments because many of the governments just don't have the infrastructure that first world governments have. So particularly in Southeast Asia, um, they need help, they need help with education, and they need help with just the basic infrastructure. So, you know, complex problem, but, you know, it, it's, it's important we get action on this. Um, now, uh, I'd like to move over to government. Um, Mary Ng, uh, you're uh, from Canada, yep. and um, maybe you, can you first tell us a little bit about what, what's the Canadian government doing uh, about this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, work in the administration of uh, Justin Trudeau, who's our prime minister, and uh, climate change and the environment very much is uh, a commitment that we have made to the people of Canada. And uh, I will be very happy to also tell, uh, you know, to tell Isabel and everyone that uh, Canada just a few weeks ago announced a ban on single-use plastics, and uh, we hope that we will get that done by 2021. <laughs> So whether it is, um, you know, as uh, you know, as was said, uh, you know, when you put uh, when you put economics into it, then uh, then there are some sort of incentives that will that will that will create a change of behavior. So whether it's putting a price on pollution, or putting a ban on single-use plastics, or providing investments, we have a hundred million dollar fund that is actually going to help the world um, take advantage of how they will be able to get rid of uh, you know plastics in um, you know in their uh, you know in their countries so we are contributing as a, we're doing our bit at home but we're also contributing uh, internationally as well the other piece that is really sort of sympathetic as I hear or as I hear you speak is uh, the work that we have been doing to incent for solutions so clean tech solutions. Um, you know, the government of Canada has put out a venture capital fund, same kind of idea that is going to fund for solutions by companies, by startups, and by those who are creating uh, solutions that is going to take plastic out of the current system. Find solutions that is going to, um, you know, that's going to reuse and create sort of that circular, uh, the circular use of it. In fact, I have a, you know, a Canadian entrepreneur, and you know, I'm here at WEF, so I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I can't lose the opportunity to plug a Canadian entrepreneur. But mm. ERS Fuels, who makes these things, this is made out of plastic. It takes plastic out of the, um, you know, out of, uh, out of use, but it is also a fuel source. So this is intended to also be. Uh, the replacement to coal. So this is one type of a company or another company in uh, Atlantic Canada that has just created an entire uh, construction, an entire house out of plastic. So the ability to be able to incent our private sector to come up with solutions that's going to take plastic out of our system, but at the same time uh, be able to find uh, solutions that will also reduce the use of as in the case of banning single-use plastics, is what we are doing, um, some of the things that we are doing as a Canadian government. Thank you uh, very much, Mary. And you know, what I find personally so exciting about the whole plastics uh, discussion is the way from very quickly, I think only a couple of years ago, many of us weren't thinking about this, apart from Isabel, of course. Um, but uh, now we are sitting together, uh, and, and there's so much interest also in this room here, you know, for, for finding solutions to this problem, you know, and I think governments around the world uh, and companies around the world are all keen to, uh, to do this. 
So there's a lot of, a lot of energy here. And, and uh, you know, maybe I'd like to go back to you, Isabel. Knowing that there is so much interest, what would you like to see more of uh, among this community? Um, I, yeah. I definitely think, you know, as um, you mentioned before, I think collaboration is key. Right? Everybody has something unique to bring to the table. The youth, you know, with their activism and their creative ways of thinking. You know, the industry with their solutions and their technology and the government as well with their support of, you know, the platform. And so I think even more if you're looking at other parts of the puzzle, there's not only one solution, right? Of course, the short-term solution is, you know, turning off the tap and saying no to those single-use plastics. But in the long term, it's making sure that we are using plastic in a responsible way and stopping this mass consumerism mindset that we have to it. And so I think definitely in the future in order to create you know, a sustainable system in which we use our resources, we definitely need to collaborate with each other. Um, and I think we can all agree that there definitely needs to be a change in mindset. I love what the youth are doing though. The youth mm -hmm. and Isabel, what you are doing I see that in Canada as well. I travel and visit schools all across, you know, all across, uh, you know, in my own community that I represent. But the Prime Minister has a youth council, and uh, that advises him very particularly on the issues that matter to him. And I can tell you, the environment, <coughs> climate change is absolutely right up there at the top. So thinking about how we work as government, together with private sector, but also. Um, also our young people, how we can actually drive for that change through those collaborations and through the right investments and harnessing the power of the private sector and the collaborations with corporates, I think, excuse me, I think is, um, is where we need to be charting the road into the future. Yeah, I think Isabel also makes a great point on using the right material for the right use. Yeah. Um, so you, we also have to be a bit careful here of um, the overall sustainability including also carbon because mm. you know you got things like food waste you know 30 percent of food waste globally if we stop using plastic in some of those areas we'll increase food waste and then we'll increase carbon so carefully assessing which material is used for which application which purpose, yeah. and then figuring out how we you know, dispose and reuse um, is, is a science in itself I mean, it is pretty complex because you can have some perverse incentives here, you know, where you ban one thing and then create a, a worse problem somewhere else. So, um, you know, life cycle analysis is, is really quite a complex tool. Um, there aren't enough um, people doing those analysis because it really is, if you do it properly, it is a pretty complicated um, analytical tool. So if, if, we, if we look at this holistically, um, what is the right material to use for the right application? then we're going to use plastics in the right places um, and other materials where that's the more sustainable, <coughs> sustainable option. For sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You know, um, one thing comes to mind is that uh, China has recently started an import ban on, uh, on waste uh, and also including uh, plastic and that's had a lot of repercussions around uh, the world and uh, some governments uh, complained about the fact that it was introduced so quickly and that it gave little time <laughs> For, uh, for people to adjust. Um, and, and I guess personally, I'm also uh, working for an environmental NGO. I do worry sometimes that perhaps um, waste that's destined, that's traveling around the world, inadvertently ends up uh, in the ocean, doesn't really get treated properly. Um, and so this is, this is something that in a way is good. You know, when China says no to this, everybody wakes up to the reality that so much of this waste has been shipping around the world and that actually creates a lot of risk uh, inherent in the system. So um, I think we've had uh, quite a bit of words from the panel. Uh, I'd like to open up to the audience. Uh, we've got a roaming microphone. Um, is there anybody who would like to interact or uh, has, has good ideas for how we can move forward on this? Thank you. My name is Tetsuji Ida. I'm a science news writer based in Tokyo. I'm reporting in, but I'm quite a long time. Uh, recently, I'm a plastic news writer. Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear what's, oh, yes. uh, what's my your name company. Is okay, my name is Tetsuji Ida. <laughs> oh, I'm an environment news writer based in Tokyo. And in these days, I'm a plastic news writer. And my question goes forward to the minister from Canada. <coughs> the one of the good things and bad things of plastic is too cheap. 
too cheap. Plastic is very cheap. Right. And <coughs> do you have any uh, incentive system, the policy to make alternative products make more po competitive with budget plastics? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that uh, you know we are taking is that we know that um, 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 we know that uh, the you know the production of um, you know the production for plastics is uh, you know is hydrocarbon, and uh, we have put a price on pollution in Canada, and um, and as a way of encouraging companies to be able to take their own climate action because it's going to cost them, I mean, you know, to, uh, you know, to produce. Um, so that's one of the things that we are doing by way of, um, you know, by, I think your phrase was, uh, if, you, if you implement something where the, econ you know, where there's an economic impact, then, uh, then it does, in fact, incent um, and change and modify behavior. Um, let's see more hands. Who else wants to uh, contribute? I see one hand over here, two. <coughs> Uh, maybe you can both go ahead and ask, and then we can respond uh, in one go. Okay, uh, so my name is David, David Wong from Bueller, as a Swiss company. We heavily, certainly working a lot on, you know, uh, put interest in really, you know, our in innovation interest in this plastic thing. One question probably to uh, Dal, you know, Jonathan, probably to you will be, uh, as a corporation, <laughs> you know, uh, I would say the global leading corporation in the chemical side. Uh, do you guys think of any technology roadmap, um, for example, you know, biodegradable or whatever, try to drive this in, in a given time and see or align with any other, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, agencies, you know, or companies to drive the progress? I mean, more from technology, you know, point of view. You know, do you have any insights about that? Okay. We'll take that one. Okay, yeah, let me, um, let me talk about some of the, um, the innovations that we are looking at. And uh, this is partly as Dow, but also the Alliance members are, are doing similar things. Um, so that the first of which is, can you get another life from plastics? So um, we're finding now applications, and I like your little brick, but we have, um, we have now a construction brick, mm -hmm. which you can um, shred, mechanically shred the, the plastic reconstitute it um, and actually make a, um, a brick. And we built a house in Brazil with these bricks. Um, another example, we've just finished our first one kilometer of um, road. So replacing bitumen with plastic um, and using that to be able to bind together the asphalt um, and laying that down in, um, we, we built a road in Thailand. So that's not fully circular. So we're using one application of plastic, finding another um, the, other, the other piece, and it's a longer term piece, but it's, it's probably the ultimate solution is around feedstock recycling, um, which is taking that plastic all the way back into a material that we can then start again and get the, the, the loop to be fully circular. Um, so, you know, innovation is going to be a very, very important part of this. Um, mobilizing technology, obviously from our own type of companies, big companies around the world, but also from, from startups. You know, so going back to this idea of the funding, you know, if, if people have great technology ideas, um, you know, what, what is it that can help to make plastic circular? Um, so, you know, it, technology will definitely be one of the, um, the, the contributory um, solutions to this. Uh, sorry, I, I, I want to follow up on, uh, on that one with a question. So I've heard that some uh, plastics, when they are uh, called biodegradable or whatever, that they actually end up uh, breaking down, but they break up, break into these micro uh, plastic particles. Is that true for, for all biodegradable plastics, or are there any technologies for plastics that don't have that um, property? Yeah, there's a couple of um, confusing words. We throw the word bio out there, so there's two, two bios. There's biosourced, and if you, if you create a biosourced plastic, it really doesn't make any difference to the, 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 the waste issue. Because you know, where it came from, it's still a piece of waste plastic. Um, the, the other issue is the one you refer to when you have biodegradability. Um, and by the whole nature of plastic, if you want to create a plastic film for a, a piece of food, um, you don't want it to degrade. Um, and so the, the, the dilemma here is if you make it biodegradable, um, you end up almost making the problem worse because you can't control the rate of biodegradability 
um, and the pace at which it biodegrades. So it, there may be some technology that comes along that allows you to be very specific, um, but at the moment, biodegradability is, is, is probably not an easy answer to the, the problem. All right, so biodegradability is uh, yesterday. Um, who else has a question? Thank you. <clears throat> Douglas McCauley, I'm a professor of ocean science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. It sounded like there's some interesting things happening on the R&D side for circularity and some really great policy actions. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, celebrate and, uh, and applaud Canada's leadership. A uh, question on the government side for promoting this kind of move for new innovation and innovation towards circularity. Some really exciting things, pulling levers to help reduce use of single-use plastics. What kind of levers can governments pull is Canada considering for promoting circularity or for actually accelerating some of this innovation that sounds like it's happening inside labs of industry to get us new materials and get us to new structures that help facilitate onboarding of this circularity? So for government, it's being able to provide an environment that allows for an acceleration of these kinds of collaborations and partnerships. In fact, Canada is hosting the World Circular Economy Conference in 2020. It's where the world can come together and we can actually look at uh, what we are doing in other jurisdictions to tackle the issue of, uh, you know, of plastics in our, you know, in our society, but it really is being able to bring sort of some of the very best brains and some of the very best solutions that could potentially come together. But the way we've sort of done this is that, um, you know, part of it is putting bans in place or putting a hundred million dollar fund to help developing countries also tackle the issue of plastics, prohibiting microbeads in our toiletry. So some of these are sort of the regulatory uh, work that Canada has done. The other part is very much creating the incentives that, uh, you know, in clean tech. So whether it is startups or whether it is collaborating with the corporates to really create that environment that enables for that kind of work to take place. So, you know, we in the last five years have put uh, over $800 million in venture capital alone. So it's government venture capital that actually is going to leverage private sector capital, which now has made Canada the second um, next to the U.S. Uh, jurisdiction that has uh, robust venture capital. But some of this is going to go into those very innovations that is getting developed, whether it be in our research institutions and universities or elsewhere where Canada is very open to collaborating with. But I think being able to convene and have particularly a conference that we're hosting on the circular economy is creating that kind of environment for us to together uh, tackle uh, some of the uh, some of these issues and in fact identify the opportunities so it's uh, it's it's a suite of uh, of um, interventions and actions but it really is about leadership and providing the context uh, for business and others to take their part in it uh, who else uh, wants to uh, to make a comment or ask I'd like to talk about the uh, correct problem statement. It's not a plastics, it's the plastics waste. Yes. Plastics is not a devil. We cannot live without plastics. Mm. Thank you. Well, sure, if, I can, if I can add on to that, um, I think we definitely see, you know, how resilient plastic can be as a resource and how useful it can sometimes be. But I think in, in, in the way that we are now, especially in developing countries and in my home island of Bali, you know, one of the reasons why plastic is such a big problem is because we are not seeing a proper way for us to sustain, sustainably process our waste, right? There is a lack of island-wide or even na nationwide um, facilities and infrastructure to deal with plastic waste, which often forces the local people to either burn their waste, bury their waste, or just litter it. Right, which, which is quite, that's when plastic really becomes the issue. Um, so yes, for sure, I definitely agree with you. Yeah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, the, the fact that governance is, can be pretty weak uh, in some countries, and um, I can imagine perhaps in Indonesia, people, even though they know it's a problem, it may be a problem to some, and, and not such a problem to others, and so, you know, still so much of it ends in the ocean. We've heard very conflicting statistics about how, how much of the waste in the, in the ocean comes from China. Um, 
I work in China, and uh, it's confusing. And so the Chinese government says, no, it's not that much. And others say, yeah, you're like a third of the problem. And so you get the finger pointing. But I think they're, they, in China, they're ready to do something about it as well, which is very encouraging. And then I think the go governance in China is relatively strong. You know, I could see uh, major steps being taken in the next, in the next year or two. Um, that's my prediction anyway. I think this issue that Isabel raises, though, with the, um, the, the, third, the third world waste infrastructure um, is really the biggest problem here because you've got, you got two problems together, which is education mm. um, to know that you shouldn't throw the, the, the plastic in the river in the first place. Um, and that's a social um, education program that isn't easy. But then you've got the practical issue of there really is no waste collection infrastructure. So in, in those kind of countries, Mm. That's got to be the priority. No, for sure. And if I can add on that, you know, if you think about it, saying no to single-use plastic bags, you can make that change overnight yourself, individually, right? It shouldn't take six years of campaigning right. for it to happen. That's an insanely long amount of time. But the reason that it took so long was definitely because we had a main focus on education and socializing within schools, communities, to really get the message out there to local communities to understand why these regulations needed to be put into place, right? Because if a, you know, the governor just says, okay, we have to ban plastic bags and the local people do not understand why, then it will not be implemented and it will not be followed. And so that's why we, as you know, a grounds up people movement, really saw the value in doing those social awareness campaigns and education. So, <coughs> yes. Um, mm. Good morning. Thank you very much for your um, discussion. I wanted to ask about the psychology of tipping points, because uh, we've been um, emitting carbon for a long time, then all of a sudden we are finding ourselves in a climate crisis. We've been uh, using single-use plastics for quite a long time, uh, staring up cocktails without any moral <coughs> dilemma until now. Uh, and I, I was intrigued about uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's Youth Council, and I'm thinking, what else can we do in society to make sure that this, we don't get to these tipping points? And I'm just thinking about the United Nations Biodiversity Report, which um, maybe there were a couple of articles here and there, but um, you know that when is that going to hit us in the face? And how can we make sure that we are more systematic about dealing with issues as they, as they emerge rather than when they become a crisis? Hmm. Who should take that one? Take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, just wanted to point out that solutions are there. So, I myself are involved in <coughs> two projects. Uh, one <coughs> would be the reverse engineering of plastics in, back into original form to the field, and the other one was to make create another different fuel on there. So, but. What we come in is that, you know, although that Mr. Prentice is uh, saying there is funds in there, that there's recognitions in there, we do not and we cannot identify those, and as for the NGOs as well, to come and actually see uh, for themselves how these uh, industry has changed and is able to give that change back to the community. So there's that support, there's, lack, there's a lack of support that I should say, that from all the responsibles, you know, makers and breakers, if you call them, the, from those people that to come and support the industries that are actually finding solutions. Thank you. So we have another minute or so. Uh, I'll give one quick opportunity res to respond to the last comments, and then I want to give the final word to Isabel. It is maybe a comment on that, and I, I think it's, it's tying up the dots um, between entrepreneurs, governments, um, big business, um, and, and, and trying to find better ways of communicating. Because I agree with you, there are solutions out there, there are entrepreneurs out there. There's goodwill, there's money, there's regulation, um, there's youth activism. But it's, it's forums like this, actually, which we need more of, um, so that actually there's a better connectivity. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I want to echo off of that on my last note, is definitely the, the importance of connecting the dots and bringing everyone together, right? Like you said, there's a bit of lack of support um, for the industry, and I feel, you know, often as, young, as a young voice and young representative, there's sometimes a lack of support for the younger generation in a standing up and being part of, you know, forums like this and so on. And I, I can imagine that every different person has their own, you know, sort of setbacks. And having said that, I do want to ask a question really quickly to the audience. Is anyone here in the room under the age of 20? I think you know the answer already. I, di I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> Physically or mentally? <laughs> Both. No. But I just wanted to sort of highlight and leave you guys all with the, you know, the thought that when World Economic Forum reached out to us saying, hey, we would love to have you, know, you come to our uh, annual meeting of the Young Champions to be the voices of the youth. You know, and I, we absolutely jumped on the opportunity because we really believe in the importance of giving young people a seat at the table, right? And so hopefully next year, I hope when I ask, you know, to a room full of people who's under 20, we have more than just me. And we have an entire panel of young people and young voices really highlighted highlighted here at the conference because I think it's also more important than, you know, just being here for the three days or for, um, you know, the, the days that you make those important decisions, but it's really to allow us to be a part of the process. And we see that, you know, with the World Economic Forum and their global shapers, which are incredible, but that's still above 20. And so we'd love to see next year's um, definitely the age, you know, being reduced and, and to really bring in the, the younger, youngest generation. So let's hear it up for uh, Isabel one more time and yes. our panel. So, and and uh, thank you for your interest in the plastic revolution. Uh, let's keep thank it going. You.